الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين All praise and thanks belongs to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and may the peace and blessing of Allah be upon his servant and final messenger Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam As to what follows my dear respected brothers and sisters in Islam Assalamu alaykum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh We continue with the 15th dhikr that we started two nights ago and that was that the messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam taught us to say in the morning and in the evening seven times hasbi allahu la ilaha illa hu alayhi tawakkaltu wa huwa rabbul arsh al azim and we had a we had a long discussion on the first part which is hasbi allah and there's one more hadith uh, to add to this and perhaps it's a hadith that revises the whole matter with us and that is the hadith of Abdullah ibn Mas'ud radiyallahu anhu in where he narrated that the messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said man nazalat bihi faqatun fa'anzalaha bin nas lam tusadd faqatuh wa man nazalat bihi faqatun fa'anzalaha billahi fayushiku allahu lahu bi rizqin ajilin aw ajil and nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said and this is such an incredible hadith that is going to teach you the importance of Hasbi Allah, declaring that Allah is sufficient and enough for you. And word for word, Allah is sufficient for you. Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, whoever falls into a troubled, difficult situation, he experiences a hardship of any sort, and he seeks the help of people as a first resort, his difficult situation will never end. It will remain as it is. And whoever falls into a troubled, difficult situation, and then he seeks the help of Allah. See, you can only seek the help of Allah if you know Hasbi Allah, that Allah is enough for me and He's sufficient for me. So he seeks the help of Allah. Allah Azza wa Jal will send him provision sooner or later, meaning relief is on its way. So this is a beautiful hadith that hopefully concludes our discussion with Hasbi Allah. So whenever you find yourself in a difficult situation, whether it's financial or some emotional trouble, physical difficulty, relationships, whatever the case is, you always turn to Allah Azza wa Jal first through dua and worship. But when we say we turn to Allah Azza wa Jal, what does that mean? Practically, it means through dua that you ask Allah Azza wa Jal for relief. When you ask Allah Azza wa Jal to remove the harm away from you and to bring the good for you, and also through worship. What we mean by this is that you implement Allah's commands, especially during that difficult time. That's what turning to Allah means. Because people, they lose their relationship with Allah, most likely when there are difficult situations that face them in life. When things are good, it's easy to worship Allah Azza wa Jal. Things are good. But when things are difficult, this is when a person is being tested. That's when he begins to doubt Allah Azza wa Jal, slowly, slowly moving away from the worship altogether. So when we say we turn to Allah in difficult situations, we mean through a dua and obeying his commandment, like Musa alayhi salam. Musa alayhi salam is an ext- he's in an extreme difficult situation. When in front of him is the ocean and behind him is Fir'aun and the soldiers of Fir'aun, almost two million, as Ibn Kathir rahimahullah mentions. Left and right of them, they can't go anywhere. And he's standing there with 600, almost 600,000 of Bani Israel, the weak and the old, everyone's with him. And there's this ocean in front of him. Allah Azza wa Jal commands him. He says to him, اضرب بعصاك البحر the staff that you had in his hand, strike the sea with it. That's a commandment during a difficulty. And he obeyed Allah Azza wa Jal. Even though if you just looked at the commandment, you'd say, how does this make sense? If I take a, a, a stick and I strike it onto the ocean, well, what's that going to do anyway? What, would it do? what effect is it going to have? Musa alayhi salam did not sit there and ask a question and doubt Allah and allow evil thought to creep into his mind. Is Allah mocking us or is he taking care of us? What is this? He immediately headed towards the ocean and struck it with that 
stick that he had and relief came. He obeyed Allah's command and the ocean split open and they were saved from Fir'aun and from this huge calamity that they were facing. The idea is worshipping Allah and obeying his command even in the most difficult situation that equals to relief as we learned from this hadith and that's the entire point of Hasbi Allah, that's what we're learning. Hasbi Allah. The next part, La ilaha illa hu. See, the one who says Hasbi Allah, Allah is sufficient for me. And he says it from his heart and he grasps its true meaning, then most definitely he will come to the conclusion that La ilaha illa hu. So that's the connection between the first part and the second part. That Hasbi Allah. When you declare Allah is sufficient for me and you reflect over all these matters that we discussed, you can only come to one conclusion. And that is La ilaha illa hu. There is no Lord worthy of worship except Him. We also learn that true Tawheed, perfecting this Tawheed would, would mean, would it include that you rely upon Allah Azza wa Jal in the sense that He is sufficient and enough for you in all matters of life. La ilaha illa hu. This is all of our deen. This is known as Kalimatul Tawheed, Kalimatul Taqwa, and many other uh, يعني, references to it. And we realize that throughout these adhkar, and a lot more to come, this La ilaha illa Allah, La ilaha illa Hu, La ilaha illa Ant, is always been repeated. So if you're reading the adhkar from the beginning to the end, all of them, you are most likely going to repeat this over 40 to 50 times just in the adhkar alone this is separate to saying la ilaha illallah wa la sharika lahu wal mulku wa alhamdu wa ala kulli shay'in qadir that is said either one time or 10 times or 100 times in other narration 200 times when we get there we'll explain the difference between the numbers and what all that means but how many times are you repeating la ilaha illa hu la ilaha illallah in adhkar al sabah in the morning and in the evening and why is that the case? The repetition always has a benefit. And Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam brings our attention to something concerning our iman. He said, إِنَّ الْإِيمَانَ لَيَخْلَقُ فِي جَوْفِ أَحَدِكُمْ كَمَا يَخْلَقُ الثَّوْبِ Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, Iman in the heart of any one of you, يَخْلَق It wears and it tears away. Just like clothing wears and tears away. And iman that's inside of us, it goes down, it uh, tears away, just like the cloth. You see, the problem is, if your cloth wore and tore away, at least I can come and say to your brother, this, your shirt is ripped. I can bring your attention to it, and as a result, you go and you look after it, you stitch it, you throw it, you buy one, you can do something about it. But the problem here is that this iman that is wearing and tearing away, it's fi jawfi ahadikum. It's inside, it's hidden, we cannot see it. But the Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is telling us a reality. Just like your clothes on the outside tears and wears away, and you're very concerned to always have a presentable look in society, which is fine, no problems. But then a lot more concern should be put in that situation for the heart, because that's what's presented before Allah azza wa jal. And that tears and wears away, and that needs to be repaired. It needs to be repaired. This is why Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam at the end of that hadith, he said, فَاسْأَلُوا اللَّهِ أَنْ يُجَدِّدَ الْإِيمَانَ فِي قُلُوبِكُمْ Ask Allah azza wa jal that he replenish, that he renew this iman that is in your hearts. And the best way to renew al iman in the heart is to reflect upon la ilaha illa Allah and to repeat la ilaha illa Allah, to grasp its meaning. To pour it all over and into your heart. This is the purpose of life. The greatest thing you will meet Allah Azza wa Jal with on the day of judgment is La ilaha illallah. Even if you committed a million sins and you did not repent with, from them, you still have hope. You still have hope somewhere there. As the Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he said, لَوْ بَلَغَتْ ذُنُوبُكَ عَنَانَ السَّمَاءِ ثُمَّ لَقِيتَنِي لَا تُشْرِكُ بِي شَيْئًا غَفَرْتُ لَكَ عَلَى مَا كَانَ مِنْكَ وَلَا أُبَالِي Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he said, if your sins were to reach عَنَانَ السَّمَاءِ, if they were to reach the clouds, you know what that means? 
That means in every inch on earth, you've committed a sin. And you've piled them all up until it reached the clouds. Then you move your foot to the next path. Then you fill it all up. Then you move, and across the globe like this, across the entire world, you step your feet and you do so much sins at that one area that the sins have filled up all the way to the clouds. Who can even do this? You need more than a lifetime to do this. But even if that was the case, and you met Allah Azza wa Jal, having disassociated him from any partners, meaning you came with a tawheed with la ilaha illallah, then Allah Azza wa Jal will forgive such a person. For this, this is the greatest thing you can prepare for and meet Allah Azza wa Jal with. Hence the importance of why it's mentioned in al kaarul Sabah al masa hundreds and hundreds of times. To always keep that iman refreshed and renewed. Now, so this is the purpose of life. And this is, of course, the first commandment that Allah Azza wa Jal would mention in the Quran. Ya ayyuhal nas, u'budu rabbakum alladhi khalaqakum walladhina min qablikum la'allakum tattaqoon. O mankind, worship your Lord. That's the first commandment in the Quran. And it is the message of the greatest ayah in the Quran. Well, the greatest ayah in the Quran is what? Ayat al-Kursi. Why was it the greatest ayah? Because its central message is all about La ilaha illallah. And that's how it starts. Allahu la ilaha illa huwa al-hayyul qayyum. And this is of course the message of every prophet and messenger that Allah Azza wa Jal sent to mankind. وَلَقَدْ بَعَثْنَا فِي كُلِّ أُمَّةٍ رَسُولًا لَنِعْبُدُ اللَّهَ وَاجْتَنِبُ الطَّاغُوتِ As Allah Azza wa Jal mentions in Surah Al-Nahl. And today, of course, there is a dire need to discuss at tawheed and discuss La ilaha illallah and to spread the knowledge of this word. In every corner of the globe, there is a great and an immense need. You know, I bring your attention to something. There are some people that criticize those who continuously discuss the matter of a tawheed in, in its depth, right? And they emphasize it in their da'wah and so on. So you have a, a group of people that criticize such preachers and scholars. And all he's got in his life is a tawheed moving from one book of tawheed to another. And then going through the books of a tawheed uh, from the hadith books and so on. What, where, what have we learned? We've learned nothing. He moves from one book of tawheed to another. We don't need this. There are people that talk like this. I tell you something. And these are very same people that will say, Ya Ammi, Ya Sheikh, our youth are lost. They're in drugs. They're in a zina. They're in the clubs. They're in the pubs. Uh, there is haram wealth being consumed and made on the streets. People are killing one another. There is addiction problems online. Talk to us something that solves the problem of the, of the community. Shuf, subhanallah. And Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, when he was sent to Mecca in the early days of Islam, what was the situation of the people? The situation of the people was absolute corruption. They were alcoholics. They were killing one another. There was gambling. There was a riba and the worst type of it. There was all this stuff and probably a lot more than what is seen today. All of that was there. And the first rulings and the first ayat that would be revealed in Mecca and all throughout his 13 years was all about at tawheed Nothing else about declaring the oneness of Allah Azza wa Jal and its true reality and what it means. It was about the names of Allah Azza wa Jal. It was about belief in Allah and the last day and the angels and so on. That was the Quran al Makki. 13 years of Quran was like that. So it makes absolute sense that this is the only matter that will get rid of corruption in society. If you want to eliminate corruption from society and you think you can do that by other than the knowledge of a tawheed, you are absolutely wrong and perhaps this is why corruption remains among us. When ulama rahimahumullah, they said, Aslu kulli sharrin ash-shirk. The essence of every evil on earth, the essence of every injustice and oppression on earth is a shirk, is associating partners with Allah. 
That's the essence. Anything evil you see on earth, it's, it's got roots with a shirk. And every goodness on earth that you see, its essence is a tawheed. Oneness in Allah Azza wa Jal. So this is why we need to be careful not to fall into such criticism against those that preach and teach a tawheed and dedicate an entire lifetime to do this. Allah, these are the most intelligent people. These are the people that understood. If a people understood a tawheed in its reality, all corruption would be eliminated. Imagine. Imagine you took a group of people that are alcoholics, or zina, or khamar, and all of these matters. And he said to them, come, I'm going to teach you about Allah Azza wa Jal. This is who Allah Azza wa Jal is. This is the greatness of Allah Azza wa Jal. This is Allah Azza wa Jal's relationship with his servant. And he continued to talk about Allah to these people for a month. The effect this will have would be unlike anything else. And this is knowledge about Allah. People disobey Allah because they don't know who Allah is. This is why they disobey him. Allah said, highlighting the biggest problem on earth. وَمَا قَدَرُ اللَّهَ حَقَّ قَدْرِهِ This here, five words, summarizes the entire problem on earth. And they did not honor Allah the way he deserves to be honored. But see, this, this, is, this is the summary of all problems. وَمَا قَدَرُ اللَّهَ حَقَّ قَدْرِهِ And how do you solve this? By teaching who Allah is and the honor that Allah Azza wa Jal deserves. وَمَا قَدَرُ اللَّهَ now, and then take this further. When the Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam finally moves from Mecca, the migration, al-Hijrah, to al Madina, you know what were the first ayat that were revealed unto him? A few, يعني, a few weeks, a few months later, or the first surah that was revealed was Wailul lil Mutafifin, that was in al Madina. A few weeks later, Allah Azza wa Jal reveals unto him, and this is an ayah from Surah Muhammad. He says to him, فَعْلَمْ أَنَّهُ لَا إِلَهَ إِلَّا اللَّهِ Know and bear in mind that there is no Lord worthy of worship except Allah. No, now I know this for the last 13 years. And I've been teaching this for the last 13 years. What does it mean, know? Let me know this is the only thing you're supposed to know and increase in. And educate the community upon. 13 years! And the first command coming down, فَعْلَمْ أَنَّهُ لَا إِلَهَ إِلَّا اللَّهِ Then this is the correct approach for the Muslim to grasp and understand the importance of a tawheed and its effect in eliminating corruption on earth. And this would be a very nice kind of lecture to be done or an essay or something. التوحيد وَأَثَرُهُ فِي أُصْلَاحِ الْمُجْتَمَعِ Tawheed and its effect in cleansing corruption and rectifying the situation in communities and societies. Hasbi Allah la ilaha illahu. Another thing we can reflect on when reading the word la ilaha illahu, especially in this dhikr, that is that the Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam promised, the one who said this seven times in the morning, seven times in the evening, what did he promise? The Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, كفاه الله ما أهمه من أمر الدنيا والآخرة. الله would be enough for him from anything that concerns him in this worldly life and concerns him in the afterlife. طيب يعني one of the greatest things that concern, our concerns concerns meaning our worries, our troubles, our problems, matters that bring us anxiety, depression, sadness, the stressful matters. This is ما ما أهمه. All these emotional uh, matters, Allah Azza wa Jal will be enough for you. We'll remove them all. And why is this the case? What's the secret? In this dhikr, Hasbi Allah, la ilaha illa hu, alayhi tawakkaltu wa huwa rabbul arsh al -azim. The secret in this dhikr that eliminates all these troubles in life is the word la ilaha illa Allah. I think I've shared this with you before, I'm not sure, but I said that Many years ago, we did a research into all the ahadith that Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam mentioned as a cure for the person that is in stress and experiencing depression and anxiety. We went through all those ahadith and we found there's one common thing. In all of them, there was 
La ilaha illallah in there somehow. In all of them. Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he says, Da'watul makrub, the dua of the distressed person, is the dua of Yunus, which is, La ilaha illa ant subhanaka inni kuntu min al There was a la ilaha illallah. Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam says to Asma bint Umais that when you are in a distressful moment, say, Allah, Allah, Rabbi la ushriku bihi shay'a. Well, that's la ilaha illallah. Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam in a dua, he teaches us and he says that whoever says this dua, that Allah azza wa jal will exchange his sadness to happiness. It does not only get rid of the sadness and the depression, Rather, Allah Azza wa will remove it and replace it with much happiness. That long dhikr, dua, it started with Allahumma inni abduka wa abnu abdika wa abnu amatik. Oh Allah, I am your slave, the son of your slave, the son of your female slave. And that's once again, what is, what, that's la ilaha illallah. That's nothing but la ilaha illallah. Right? And once again, this dhikr as well, ma ahammahu. The matters that concern you, the worries and the depression, will all be taken care of. And we find as well within this dhikr, La ilaha illa hu. Why is that the case? Because I said to you, La ilaha illallah is the purpose of life. And the more you are engaged in the purpose of life, the more you are engaged in what you are created for, what your heart was created for, the more tranquility and peace descends upon you. Because you're doing what you are created for. We give the example of like a fish. The fish, it was created to be in the water. If the fish is in the water, it's all good. It swims and it glides peacefully. Remove it from the water and it's stressed. It shakes violently because you took it out of its environment. It's not supposed to be outside. Well, the believer, when you come out of the environment of Iman, you become like a fish that's disturbed. And so the heart begins to shake and it vibrates and a person is all in all sorts of distress and calamities and worries and sadnesses. So what's the solution? Go back into your environment. Your environment is la ilaha illallah. Go back there and the heart begins to settle because now it's doing what it was created for. So the one who keeps repeating la ilaha illallah and these adhkar hasbi Allah, la ilaha illahu, no matter what situation he's in, it has to calm down that, that disturbed heart. To calm it down. Because you are engaged in what you are created for. That's the idea of Hasbi Allahu la ilaha illahu. Now, then the Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he teaches us here, we say Hasbi Allah la ilaha illahu alayhi tawakkalt. Imagine, until you're, you're, you're beginning your morning with this. Anything that has disturbed you last night or this morning, you're repeating this dhikr, these worries, and, the, and, the, and this, uh, this emotional state you're in should calm down. Now, I said to you yesterday, it necessar doesn't necessarily mean that the calamity will end and it will go. The calamity will remain there, but the calmness and the tranquility will descend upon the heart. We gave the example of like Ibrahim alayhi salam, he's still in the fire, he's still in his calamity. But bardan wa salama, the, uh, the calmness and the tranquility descends upon him. So here, hasbi Allah, la ilaha illahu. Now we say, alayhi tawakkalt. Upon him I rely. What is the relationship between la ilaha illahu, alayhi tawakkalt? The relationship is mentioned in Surah المزمل. الله عز وجل says رب المشرق والمغرب لا إله إلا هو فاتخذه وكيلا الله عز وجل says that he is the lord of the east and the west there is no lord worthy of worship except him so take him as a protector as a وكيل so لا إله إلا هو you've said حسبي الله now you've said لا إله إلا هو True la ilaha illahu, once you've declared this fact, it gives you no option but to rely upon him in all your matters. So one leads to another. If you have la ilaha illallah in your heart and you find yourself relying on other than Allah, there's weakness in your la ilaha illallah. There's weakness in a tawheed. The stronger the tawheed, the stronger the yaqeen, the stronger the
tawakkul ala Allah. Well, that's the equation. The ulama, rahimahum Allah, they say from the positive effects of al-yaqeen, from the positive effects of certainty, is that a person relies on Allah Azza wa Jal. Ula ilaha illahu develops that certainty in the heart, and a positive effect of that is that you begin to rely on Allah Azza wa Jal in all your matters. Alayhi tawakkalt. He did not say, tawakkaltu alayhi. Even though in the language we could have said, Hasbi Allah la ilaha illa huwa tawakkaltu alayhi. You can say that. But alayhi, the pronoun would come first and then tawakkalt. Alayhi tawakkaltu. Wa huwa rabbul arsh al azim. Why? That creates something called al ikhtisas, exclusivity. So when we translate alayhi tawakkalt, it means I rely upon him alone and no one else. Alone and no one else. Meanwhile, if we said tawakkaltu alayhi, it means I rely upon him and it suggests that you rely upon others as well. So subhanallah, language, alayhi tawakkalt, when you're seeing this in the morning, you're reminding yourself that Allah is the only one who I rely upon and no one else in every aspect of life. Reliance upon Allah is an action of the heart. And Allah loves those who rely on Him. Inna Allah yuhibbul mutawakkilin. And a tawakkul relying on Allah is a condition of proper iman. You cannot have proper iman without tawakkul ala Allah. Allah He says, وَعَلَى اللَّهِ فَتَوَكَّلُوا إِن كُنْتُمْ مُؤْمِنِينَ Rely upon Allah Azza wa Jalla if indeed you are believers. And why do we rely upon Allah? Before I explain to you how does a person rely upon Allah, why? Why do we rely upon Allah? There is an ayah that explains this for us. Allah Azza wa Jalla, He said, وَتَوَكَّلْ عَلَى الْحَيِّ الَّذِي لَا يَمُوتِ Rely upon the one who is all living and never dies. We rely upon Allah because Allah is all living and He never dies. That's why we rely upon Him. If you rely upon anything else, then everything besides Allah will end, will perish and will be destroyed. Everything. So if I rely on other than Allah, I'm essentially relying on something that is weak, something that is doomed and will become destroyed. And so the moment that thing is destroyed, I become shattered because I have a matter that hasn't been fulfilled. I relied on someone, I relied on something, the thing got destroyed, it doesn't exist anymore, it became ruined, so I'm in all sorts of mess because I still have a, a matter that hasn't been fulfilled. The one I relied on is not here anymore. But the one who relies upon Allah Azza wa Jal, he's relying upon a strong source. The all living that never dies, and the fact that he is all living never dies, then most definitely every matter in life you have that you entrust Allah with and you rely upon him, it will be finished. It will be solved and there will be great relief from it. Subhanallah. This is why we rely upon Allah. What's the definition of alayhi tawakkal tawakkul? How is it achieved? Well, ulama rahimahumullah, they say that you rely upon Allah in all your affairs to bring you goodness and to keep away harm from you. That's what we, we rely upon Allah so that he can give us what's good for us in our health, in our wealth, in our relationships, in our spiritual matters, in our relationship with him and so on. And we rely upon him to also keep away from us all harm and evil and sins and fitan and corruption, injustice and oppression and all of that. But now the practical way of implementing a tawakkul is this. You must take by the means, then rely upon Allah, not on the means. That's practical day-to-day -day tawakkul, that's how its image should be. You take by the means that are permissible, take by means. And then you rely upon Allah Azza wa Jal to fulfill your matters. And you do not rely upon your efforts and your means. These are just efforts, means. They can work, they cannot work. We rely upon Allah Azza wa Jal to bring you the goodness and to keep away the harm from you. Yani for example, look at the case of Hajar radiyallahu anha. 
and her husband Ibrahim alayhi salam. When Ibrahim alayhi salam was commanded by Allah to keep his family in uh, the valley of Mecca, uncultivated valley, in, uninhabited, there's no one there. It's just yeah, a certain death there. He keeps her there. He gives her some water, some dates, and he goes. And she says to him, is this what Allah commanded you to do? To leave us here and go? He says, yes. She says to him, In that case, Allah will never waste us. Allah Azza wa Jal will not abandon us and neglect us. Like, that's absolute tawakkul, right? Watch this now. So she's got the water and the dates. She doesn't understand the tawakkul as being just sit there and some, somehow relief would come. The baby Ismail is crying. The narration mentions yatalabbat, begins to kick and moving his tongue from intense hunger and thirst. So his mother gets up and goes up to a mountain. This is just after she's given birth. This is very difficult. Up a mountain to the other mountain, as Safa wal Marwa, seven times. And the walk is not like today's walk. Now everything is nice and flat. Air condition is, is hitting. It gets really cold in there. Not like that. This is in the desert, in the heat, during the day. From one mountain to another. A woman that has just given birth. A woman, if they gave birth today, they take maternity leave. A few weeks off. Well, because consider of the situation. Don't sit at home. Not only that, but even Allah Azza wa Jal says, 40 days of salat I don't want. Oof. And this woman is going from one mountain to another. She's taking by the means. This is all part of the tawakkul. She took by the means. And then eventually, uh, she comes down because she hears a sound, a faint noise, a very low noise. And that was Jibreel alayhi salam. He had arrived, and either with one of his feet or one of his wings, Allahu alam what it was, but he um, struck the earth and, 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 and water, Zamzam, would gush out of that, that land. And it's with us until today. From 5, 000, almost 5,000 years ago until today, Zamzam is still coming out, Allahu Akbar, as a sign for all of us. That this is what tawakkul is. And many lessons could be learned. We're, we're taking this story from this tawakkul perspective. So Hajar radiallahu anha, she took by the means. And she exhausted herself and put every effort she can. Seven times, not one or two, seven times. In the end, she did not rely on her efforts. She relied upon Allah. How do we know? Because she said to Ibrahim, Allah will not abandon us. So she knows relief is coming from Allah. He will move off the evil, the harm away from us, this hunger and this thirst. He'll bring the goodness, which is the provision. And that's exactly what happened. This is what a tawakkul is, taking by the means. Relying on Allah, not on the means. And even if you saw the case of a Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, when he did the hijrah from Mecca to Al-Madinah, uh, Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu had prepared two camels, one for him, one for Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Fed the camels, made sure they were all well and good and healthy. Then the Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam doesn't just walk out Akta al Madina on a tawakkal ala Allah, let's just walk in front of everyone. Even though he is Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, look at the means he takes by camels. Then he, 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 he hires a guide, Abdullah ibn Urayqit, he hires a guide that's going to guide him out of the very difficult valleys of Mecca all the way to al Madina. Then he ends up in a cave, Ghar Thor, and he hides in it. They took, they did all these means to keep away from the disbelievers so they're not seen and caught. And when he is in the cave and the disbelievers get to the cave as Allah narrates the story in the Quran, he looks at Abu Bakr and he doesn't say to him, don't worry, we're in a cave. It's dark. No one will be able to see us. No one can, we're hidden in the darkness of the cave. No, these are means. Don't rely on these. He says to him, Inna Allah ma'ana. He said, Allah is with us. So he took by all the means, but he didn't rely on any of the means whatsoever, not even in his words. Right? Rather, he relied upon Allah by saying, Inna Allah ma'ana. Na'am, subhanallah. So this is why, as a student, 
when you're doing your exams, you study and you study hard. You spend the night studying, no problems, do everything you need to do. But then you rely upon Allah for success, not upon your studies and your efforts. That's what we mean. You leave the house and you're worried of harm that can reach you outside the house. You're worried, people are anxious. Sometimes people's anxiety becomes so intense that they don't even move from their beds. Those remain in bed. And you know, the therapists start giving them small tasks. Just get to the door, open it, walk out and come back in. It's a great achievement. Walk to your car and come back. And this is therapy. This is how people's situation is. We we'll ask Allah Azza wa to protect us all. But at tawakkul ala Allah, in a situation like this, when a person has this type of anxiety, we say, Akhi, take by the means. The means from them is the adhkar. Read your adhkar. Allah Azza wa Jal has promised protection for this person. And then do what is necessary. You enter your car, the seatbelt, this is a means of protection, reduces risk of whatever it is, and do all that, no problems. And then afterwards, khalas, rely upon Allah al-hafil, upon Allah, the one who protects. And don't rely upon uh, enter what, your, your seatbelt and the other things. These are all the matters. They could work, they could not work. لكن Allah هو الحافظ not the seatbelt Allah الحافظ right and so on use this kind of understanding to put this in every situation of life you get sick go to the doctors take the medicine do whatever that is required that is permissible and halal no problems do the surgery but don't rely on these things don't rely on the doctor a doctor his name is not al-shafi his name is the doctor whatever al-shafi is Allah that's his name the healer, the curer. He's the one that possesses that ability and no one else. So at tawakkul would be if you're sick. Do take by the efforts. But do not rely on them. You rely upon Allah Azza wa Jal. That way your iman remains strong. Because if the efforts didn't work, you're not going to complain. It's not going to make you lose your faith. You're going to I didn't rely on them anyway. I relied upon Allah. Allah hasn't decreed for me shifa yet. There is wisdom and knowledge in this, alhamdulillah. Right? This is how a tawakkul in its practical sense would look like. Now, also from a tawakkul, yani in terms of provision and so on, and this one's very, yani, heck, it's probably new to you. A tawakkul in terms of provision and sustenance, then a tawakkul is levels, right? There's weak tawakkul, there's strong tawakkul. From the strong tawakkul, when it comes to sustenance is that you do not count your provisions. You do not measure and calculate your provisions and your wealth and so on. You don't calculate it. In the hadith, uh, Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he said, Rahimallahu umma Ismail, lawla annaha ajilat lakana zamzam aynan ma'ina. Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he says, may Allah azza wa jal bestow his mercy upon the mother of Ismail. Hajar, in the story that we just took, had she not rushed, how did she rush? She rushed by putting Zamzam together. And she would say, Zamzam. That water was coming, it was overflowing. And so she began to collect on the sides the dust and the dirt that was around. And this is the action of Zamzam. It was called Zamzam because of the action that she did like this. She confined it. She calculated it. She measured it. She stored it in one place so that she can drink from it and so on. Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, had she not done that and left it, Zamzam would have become عَيْنًا ma'ina. It would have become a beautiful spring of water that is flowing. It would have filled half that area and people would have came and seen a nice lake there. عَيْنًا ma'ina. You see, Al-Ayn is a spring. Wal-Ma'in, it also comes from the Ayn, meaning something that could be seen. See, Zamzam now cannot be seen. It's hidden, it's under the ground. It would have been عَيْنًا. عَيْنًا meaning for the eye to see. Whoever walked past, they would have seen it. Lakin, subhanallah, she calculated, measured it, and that affected a risk. It affected the, it affected the provision. Also, we find in the hadith of uh, Aisha radiallahu anha, she says, the messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam died. وَمَا فِي بَيْتِ مِنْ شَيْءٍ يَأْكُلُهُ ذُو كَبِدْ And there was nothing in the house that a living creature could eat. Listen to this. There's nothing in the house. إِلَّا شَطْرُ شَعِيرٍ فِي رَفٍ لِي 
the hadith is in Sahih al-Bukhari. She said, except shatr shair and then like a little, a little bag of barley. Wait, there's some, some barley in there. She says, فَأَكَلْتُ مِنْهُ حَتَّى طَالَ عَلَيْهُ It was in a shelf. She'd always reach out to it, take out and eat from it. Take out and eat from it. Take out and eat from it. She said, until the time prolonged. Ya yeah, Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam died. When I've been eating this for many months. She says, فَكِلْتُهُ فَنَفَدْ She says, I measured it one day and then afterwards it finished. Uh, she measured how much there is. It looks like approximately another one more week it should finish. One more week and it finished. Measuring. Calculating a rizq has an effect on the barakah of a rizq. When Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam he said to Asma, the daughter of Abu Bakr radiallahu anha, he said to her, لا توعي فيوعي الله عليك يعني لا تقدر الأشياء Don't measure and calculate provisions. Don't measure them. Because if you do, in, uh, he says, عليك, meaning then Allah Azzawajal will deal with you in that manner. You counted it, that means in your mind, there came an expectation of how long this will last. So Allah will deal with you in that manner, and that expectation you had will be right, and it will finish at its time. You only calculate in necessities, like to know what your zakat and mal is supposed to be, and so on. But in generally, well, yeah, that the digital world, the digital currency. You don't have to calculate anything. They've calculated everything for you. But this is perhaps, Allahu A'lam, al barakah that goes away. But generally, when a person gets something, don't calculate it. You have things in the cupboard, things in the fridge. Sometimes, the mother, before she leaves the house to buy something, check how much is left in the rice. Or check how much pasta is left. See, it's almost going to finish. We'll get a new one. Oh, it's going to finish soon. So implementing these ahadith is to say, we're not going to do this. Wallahu a'lam, yani. Now, so alayhi tawakkalt. Finally, and we come to the last part of this dhikr. Wahuwa rabbu al-arsh al You see, I told you it all connects with each other. So now we're up to alayhi tawakkalt. Upon him we rely and no one else. Why do we rely upon him? That's the question. See, this dhikr gets you to think in every part of it. Why do you rely upon him? وَهُوَ رَبُّ الْعَرْشِ الْعَظِيمِ Because he is the Lord and the possessor of the mighty throne. Allahu Akbar. Yani if he's the possessor of the mighty throne, that means he owns everything else. That means the best one I can rely upon is Allah Azza wa Jal because in his, his hands is everything. He owns everything. So if I need something, I need to rely upon someone who possesses it and has it. And that is Allah Azza wa Jal. So it gives you a reason for why you rely upon him. There is the mention of Al-Arsh, Rabbu Al-Arshi al I mean, We know that the Arsh is the first creation of Allah Azza wa Jal. This is what Allah created first, Al-Arsh. We know that it is the roof of all creation. That's what Arsh means. Arsh, arsh means a roof. And so Al-Arsh is called Arsh because it is the roof of all the creation of Allah Azza wa Jal. When Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said in the hadith that if you were to ask Allah Azza wa Jal, then ask him Al-Firdaus. Because Al-Firdaus is awsatu al-jannati wa a'la al-jannah. It is the middle of the paradise and it's the highest point of the paradise. Because what the paradise is like a dome shape. So when you get this dome shape, the middle is Al-Firdaus and that would be the highest point as well. That's where Al-Firdaus is. And then the Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, wa fawqahu arsh rahman And above Al-Firdaus is the Arsh of Allah Azza wa So now, يعني just for clarification purposes, if you wanted to know exactly how the matter seems to be, it would be Arsh Allah Azza wa Jal. The Arsh of Allah is there. And it's also in a dome shape. Above the Arsh is Allah Azza wa Jal. Then there's the Arsh. Then below the Arsh, there is a water. There is a water. And the Arsh has legs. قوائم. It has legs, and these legs go through this water. And then underneath all of this, underneath the water, there is Al-Jannah, starting from Al-Firdaus and going all the way down in its levels. And the paradise is a hundred levels. Then underneath this, there is as sama the seventh sky, the sixth, the fifth, the fourth, the third, the second, the first. Then there is Jawu as sama which is this... Uh, this land, this 
يعني space that we're in right now from the sky all the way to the earth and then underneath us there are seven earths and then there is water underneath that that's the structure now well arsh itself is the biggest of what Allah Azza wa Jal created of what we know يعني العرش is bigger than the Jannah is bigger than the hellfire is of what we know you see Allah Azza wa Jal is able to create bigger than the arsh he's able Maybe there is something that he created that is greater that we don't know of. Allahu alam. But what we know is that the greatest of what Allah created is Al Arsh. Allah Azza wa is the only king whose throne is bigger than everything else he owns. Every other king on earth, his throne is small in comparison to everything he owns. Subhanallah. And the greatness of the Arsh itself, because you see, when you say, Wa huwa Rabbul Arsh al Azim, once you understand the greatness of the throne, you'll understand the greatness of Allah Azza wa Jal. Uh, Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said that the heavens and the earth, these seven heavens, and all this earth that is underneath us, in comparison to the kursi, the kursi is the footstool of Allah Azza wa Jal. It's like a ring in a desert. The ring, yani the ring of the, the armor vest. A ring in a desert. That's... The heavens and the earth in comparison to the kursi. With the kursi of Allah Azza wa in comparison to the arsh of Allah, the throne, is like also a ring in a desert. Subhanallah. This is a magnificent, huge arsh. When you know the greatness of the arsh, and that's how Allah described it. وَهُوَ رَبُّ الْعَرْشِ الْعَظِيمِ That's the same word Allah used to describe Himself, al Azim. When you know the greatness of the Arsh, you're struck with awe, saying, imagine then the greatness of Allah Azza wa Jal. Right? This is what the dhikr is putting into your heart of greatness of Allah Azza wa Jal. And of course, the distance of the Arsh as well is mentioned in a hadith of the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. I share this with you in hope that it gives us an understanding of the greatness of the Arsh. And that's not the point. The point is so that we realize the greatness of Allah Azza wa Jal. This is the hadith of Al-Abbas ibn Abd al-Muttalib radiyallahu anhu and this is a hadith that was authenticated by some of the scholars like Ibn Khuzayma wa Dhahabi wa Al-Hakimi wa Al-Hakim wa Ibn Al-Qayyim as well the Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam he said uh, oh, sorry this was uh, Al-Abbas ibn Abd al-Muttalib Who, who's Al-Abbas anyone knows? Uh, he's the uncle the uncle of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam Al-Abbas he said, Kunna inda Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. We were with the Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam one day, and he said to us, to us, Hal tadrun kam bayna as sama'i wal ard? Do you know the distance between the heavens and the earth? They said, Allah wa Rasuluhu ana. We don't know. Allah and His Messenger know best. He said, Baynahuma masiratu khamsi mi'ati sana. Between them is the distance of 500 years. Between this earth? And what is above us? Five hundred years. Then he said, and from the and the distance of every sky to the next sky is also five hundred years. And that's how many? That's that's what seven skies. So from here to the first one, five hundred years. Then between each one is five hundred years. Then the Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, وَكَثْفُ كُلِّ سَمَاءٍ سَبْعُمِئَةِ سَنَةٍ and the thickness of every sky is also 500 years. The thickness of the sky itself. And on top of the seven uh, heavens, there is, a, there is an ocean, there is a bahr. And above this ocean, when Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he said that this ocean, the distance of this ocean, from the lowest point to the highest point is also 500 years. Above this ocean is Al Arsh. And from the lowest point of Al Arsh to the highest point of Al Arsh is also 500 years. And above all of this, the Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, Wallahu subhanahu fawqa dhalik. Allah azza wa jal is above all of that. And listen to the end of the narration. He said, وَلَيْسَ يَخْفَى عَلَيْهِ مِنْ أَعْمَالِ بَنِي آدَمَ شَيْءٍ The narration mentions, and nothing of the deeds of the children of Adam is hidden from him. Show the distance where it is. And nothing is hidden. The message is, 
Allah sees every moment of your life and every second of your life. The hadith is incredible. This is the greatness of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So when you're sitting and you're reading this dhikr and you're saying, Hasbi Allah, la ilaha illa hu alayhi tawakkaltu wa huwa rabbul arsh al azim then you realize that this arsh, it's, it's in that hadith that the Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam told us nothing of our deeds are hidden to Allah. So you be sure that when you read this dhikr, that's from your deeds that Allah azza wa jalla was absolutely aware of and heard it from you. Sometimes a person could become overwhelmed. Say, yeah, man, I'm reading these afkar every day. Yeah, what is Allah listening to me? Are these afkar recorded? Yani, and I, I know I forget a few year, a few weeks later, I forget if I even read them or not. Did anyone pay attention? Did anyone take heed of my effort? And then I sat and I read that seven times. Most definitely, none of your deeds were hidden. He heard every single word you said and how you said it. And the presence of your heart, if it was there or not, he knows it all. So this encourages a person to continue doing that which pleases Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allahu Akbar. And of course, above the arsh, Allah azza wa jal wrote, Inna rahmati sabaqat ghadabi. My mercy has over, uh, overrides my anger. My mercy precedes my anger. And this is why every time Allah would mention himself upon the arsh, he would use his name Ar-Rahman. Ar-Rahman ala al-arsh istawa. In seven places of the Quran, as opposed to any name of his, any other name of his. Could have said Al Aziz Al Al Arshi Stawa. Could have been any other name. Al Jabbar Al Al Arshi Stawa. But Al Rahman Al Al Arshi Stawa. This is an encouragement to the servants that Allah Azza wa Jal has always been merciful with them. And if you always seek His mercy, Bismillah, you'll meet the mercy of Allah Azza wa Jal. And if you turn your back from His mercy and you run away from it and you don't ask it and you don't want it, then you don't get it. And your deeds are never enough to admit you into the paradise. This is why Dawood alayhi salam, when he made the dua, what did he say? وَأَدْخِلْنِي بِرَحْمَتِكَ فِي عِبَادِكَ الصَّالِحِينَ Admit me through your mercy among good companionship, which is in the paradise. He didn't say, admit me through my deeds. Through your mercy. Allah Azza wa Jalla, he says, يُدْخِلُ مَنْ يَشَاءُ فِي رَحْمَتِهِ well, the entire paradise is called Rahmatih. It's called Rahmatih. Because that's the only way you can get there, through His mercy. So when you read this dhikr in the morning and in the evening, and you're saying, وَهُوَ رَبُّ الْعَرْشِ الْعَظِيمِ And then you just, the fact that you said Al-Arsh, it reminds you. Mercy. That's what's written above the Arsh. And so it opens the door of Allah's mercy. And you're rushing towards it. It's like a call from Allah Azza wa Jal. Come, run to my mercy. Run to my forgiveness, and I give you that. Now, Allahu A'lam, the end of the hadith says, whoever says this seven times, Allah will be enough for him. From everything that concerns him in this worldly life. What are your concerns in this worldly life? Well, there are many. They are many, and in many aspects of life. All of that, Allah will be enough for you. Doesn't mean that relief is going to come without a right second. That we said, قَدْ جَعَلَ اللَّهُ لِكُلِّ شَيْءٍ قَدْرًا Whenever Allah has decreed, for relief to come, it'll come. And waiting for Allah's relief in this worldly life is a worship in and of itself. As Ibn Rajab rahimahullah mentioned, said, you're all good. Nothing is gone to waste and you're not losing any time. And also Allah Azza wa will be enough for him from everything that concerns him in the afterlife. That includes from after you die all the way until you meet Allah Azza wa Don't we all have concerns and worries in the grave or the angels that come القدر, and then resurrection, and then accountability, والصراط, all of these are huge concerns, way bigger than any concern in this worldly life. And, to, and all your worldly concerns are nothing the day you die. Finished. All put to an end. Then you got the real concerns that are coming. They're the bigger concerns. So whoever wants that Allah Azza wa Jal be enough for him for all his concerns and bring him goodness and keep him away from the evil and the harm. This dhikr, seven times in the morning, seven times in the evening, saying it with a present heart, understanding what it means, working towards it, 
And we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to grant us relief. We ask Him subhanahu wa ta'ala to grant us goodness and victory and success. We ask Him subhanahu wa ta'ala to forgive our sins, to forgive our shortcomings, to bestow His mercy and forgiveness upon us. We ask Him subhanahu wa ta'ala to guide us until the day we die. And we ask Him subhanahu wa ta'ala to accept from us all. Wallahu alam. Wa jazakum allahu khayra. Wa sallallahu wa sallam wa baraka ala nabiyyina Muhammad. Wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'in.